Freedom to me means self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Hello, good evening, everybody. I'm really happy that you're here, and I'm also really happy that you all found, found a place to, uh, to sit. So, uh, welcome. My name is Anna-Marijn Epker, and I am a program editor here uh, at Bali. I make a lot of programs on European issues, but also on many other things. Um, and I'm really happy to be your moderator tonight. I wanted to start actually with um, drawing attention to a campaign that the, part that, um, the Bali is currently supporting. And this campaign is called Vote Together. And Vote Together is an initiative that actually started during the second Forum on European Culture in uh, 2018 which was organized by the Bali and uh, Dutch culture. And for this forum, we invited um, artist and photographer Wolfgang Tillmans and architect Rem Koolhaas to join us in a quest for new ways of communicating about the EU. And during those uh, uh, four days, they came up with, with many, many solutions and many, many ideas. And one of those ideas that came out of this four-day lab is called a uh, photo together. And photo together is actually a, a large campaign that is spread out currently throughout all European countries in order to raise awareness about the upcoming European elections this month. And what we did is we developed um, uh, posters in all different EU languages and t-shirts in all different EU languages, which are currently spread throughout Europe. And we ask influential Europeans from Poland to Portugal and from, uh, from the UK to Hungary to share this message, which is actually go vote and go vote together, go vote during the European elections. So this is an impression of all these many languages. So if you want to know more about this uh, campaign, you can take a look at the website votetogether.eu. Uh, and I would really recommend you to spread this message in the coming weeks uh, in the run-up to the elections. But tonight we're here for a, a very special program, which the Bali is organizing in cooperation with Institut Français in the Netherlands. And during this program, we will deal with the question of a European people. So what is a European people? Can we speak of European people? And is this really something we should focus on or should we look at other ways of uh, defining ourselves? So this is the question at stake uh, tonight. And we're really happy that we have a very special guest here in our midst uh, to discuss. Um, as you maybe uh, read or uh, read in your email of Friday, we are really sad to let you know that um, the other main guest of this evening cannot be here tonight. Um, Rafael Enthoven had to cancel last minute because, to, because of severe uh, uh, personal circumstances. He uh, could not be here with us tonight. 
But uh, I'm happy to let you know at the same time that he sent us a video message in which he, which he explains his vision on uh, tonight's subject. So he will be here uh, in the end uh, a little bit. So we're happy to be able to share his opinions on, as well. But, um, but then a little bit about the setup of the program uh, tonight. We will open this evening with a keynote of Geraldine uh, Schwarz. After that, we will have a conversation between the two of us. We're going to look at uh, Rafael's video message and discuss the content of that message as well. And of course, I would like to end uh, with questions from you, from the audience. So also, while listening to this program, please feel encouraged uh, to think along and to uh, think already about questions you want to address. But now I would like to go to, uh, to our main guest, uh, Geraldine Schwarz. She is a French-German French journalist. She's an author. She just wrote her first book. Um, and a documentary filmmaker who is currently living and working in Berlin. She contributes uh, regularly to international newspapers such as Le Monde uh, and The Guardian, for example, also on her last book. And um, uh, the book I just referred to is called Les Amnesiek, uh, and in Dutch it's called De Geheugeloze. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you for showing. What's the, the big difference uh, between the sizes? Which one do you find more <laughs> yeah. interesting? It's, it's the paper, I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, and the book will be published uh, next week, I heard on Tuesday, but it's also already on sale uh, outside. So if you want to get hold of a copy, you can go uh, to, the, to the wooden table in the foyer after the program and buy the book already in, uh, in advance. Um, but this book that, is, that we will also discuss this evening um, is a book in which uh, Geraldine pleads for a confrontation with our past. Um, in order to prevent the rise of right-wing extremism in Europe and in order to prevent also the future in, of Europe in a way. Um, the book has been translated in many European languages already and it is really a great uh, success. She, she won many European uh, prizes in the past months. Uh, so I think we will hear much more of uh, Geraldine from now on also in the Netherlands. Um, I would like uh, uh, to ask you to give her a warm applause and to listen to her key. Goedendag. <laughs> um, hello, Netherlands. Uh, I'm quite excited about uh, the book being published by my marvelous editor sitting here in the room, Atlas Contact. Um, and there is, um, is it okay with the microphone? It's a bit aggressive. Um, and uh, there is a chapter about how the Netherlands dealt with their past, and I'm quite excited how this will be uh, uh, received uh, here in this country. But first, uh, we're here to talk about Europe, just before the European elections. <coughs> A year ago, in March 2018, I went to a village in Austria. At the entrance, there was a fairy tale castle, and outside, a sign saying, <coughs> Congress of the Defenders of Europe. I had registered under an alias, only the friendly press having been invited. I sat incognito in the middle of 300 people in an imposing room with beautiful paintings on the wall and spent the day listening to speeches by the so-called defenders of Europe. All were, from the far, all were from the far right. Elected politicians from the German AFD, AFD Partei, an Austrian FPÖ party, a Bulgarian academic, publishers, a pro-Donald Trump blogger, and Russian pro-Putin artists. The keywords of the speeches were freedom, 
peace, Europe, patriotism. All causes I actually cherish. I asked myself, have I become paranoid about these populist movements which are gaining ground in Europe? You have to hear behind the slogans to understand the bluff. Freedom then becomes freedom to compare foreigners to microbes and animals. It becomes freedom to say Negro instead of black. Patriotism becomes the right to call for the annexation by Austria of South Tyrol in Italy, a former region of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Patriotism becomes the right to call East Germany Mitteldeutschland, which means Middle Germany, as if there were still German territories beyond the Odernizer Linie line towards Poland. And defending Europe becomes waging war on the European Union and getting closer to Russia's Vladimir Putin, this friend of the far right parties. The European dream becomes restoring, I quote, old paternal values from an era when it wasn't a trend to venerate human rights. Nobody at this Congress, however, specifies which era is being referred to. I go for a walk beneath the castle's arches to get some air, where publishers display their books on stands. There I find anthropology of Europe, race, evolution, behavior. Others are titled Jewish Bolshevism or the young Hitler, a biographical correction. Some stands display accessories, medals, watches, t-shirts, paying homage to the Wehrmacht the army of the Third Reich. I hold back from buying a cup showing the silhouette of an armed German soldier in front of the Eiffel Tower and the message, greetings from Paris. I purchase a book titled Character Cleansing, the re-education of Germans and its lasting consequences. It advocates against denazification, imposed by the Allies after the war, an ode to the Germans who had so much more character before 1945. This is the exact opposite of my book, Les Amnésiques, a historical narrative where I pay tribute through my German and French family history to the long memory work which allowed the Germans to become seasoned Democrats. The issue today is not whether to defend Europe or not, but which Europe to defend. Europe's identity is inseparable from its memory. Many populist parties in Europe are reconnecting to ideas inspired by the fascism of the interwar period. By using comforting slogans, slogans such as liberty, democracy, equality, and by downplaying fascist and Nazi crimes, they are sending our vigilance to sleep. Their methods of psychological manipulation are also inspired by that past. To sow fear, to exploit our identity crisis in a globalized world, and impose a new, preferably nationalist, identity, to spread lies, create confusion with fake news. Jewish-German political scientist Hannah Arendt said, a population which no longer believes in anything can be manipulated infinitely. The ultimate step would be reverse its moral values. Good becomes evil and evil becomes good. The Third Reich was a master at this. 
If the populists win, it is their political and society model which will prevail in Europe, despite, despite the diversity of their national origins. They actually want to impose a uniform, un, uniform European identity. White, Christian, heterosexual, nationalist. An exclusionary definition of identity which amounts to designating a whole series of enemies. No one is safe from discrimination and persecution if these political parties gain a foothold in Europe. To fight this danger, we urgently need to regain our lost identity and memory. We need not by imposing one single European identity, as the populist party tried to do, but by promoting the fact that Europe's identity is precisely to have the freedom to choose our identity. We are fortunate that women and men before us fought to achieve this, and today we are enjoying the fruits of the struggle. History does not repeat itself, but sociological and psychological mechanisms remain the same, which push us in the context of a crisis to become accomplices of criminal doctrines through our apathy, conformism, blindness, and opportunism. Without this memory, that of our own fiability, a democratic and free Europe is in danger. My French grandfather was a policeman under the Vichy regime. My German grandfather was a member of the Nazi party and bought a Jewish business at a very low price in 1938. After the war, it took the courage of my father's generation to pull the German population out of amnesia and make them realize that without their passive or active complicity, the Third Reich could never have committed crimes of such magnitude. Personal responsibility has become the heart of memory work in West Germany. At school, I was taught to identify with the Mitläufer, those who go with the flow, to become aware of my own vulnerability. In this country, which has gone through the experience of both Nazi and communist ideology, I understood the influence of each of us on the course of history. Most of the Europeans have missed the opportunity to use memory work to anchor democracy in their society by making citizens the victims of history instead of empowering them did they not open the floodgates to populism, as we can see in France, Italy, Austria, the former GDR, East Germany, and in many Eastern European countries? A free and democratic Europe depends on the ability of citizens to understand their responsibilities in a political system where people have power, to form a sound opinion and to be able to make fair judgments. Remembering war, the Holocaust, and dictatorships is essential to remain vigilant. But Europeans also need a positive memory. The populists feed that need by making the past look better. In Italy, Matteo Salvini is rehabilitating fascism. In Germany, the AfD party is claiming the right to be proud of Wehrmacht soldiers. Let's not abandon positive memory to the populists. Let us restore the pride of Europeans to live on a continent whose people twice, in 1945 and in 1989, defeated totalitarianism and restored peace and dignity to the citizens. We will no longer be victims of history. Each of us will be indispensable.
Thank you very much, Geraldine. And thank you very much for your wonderful book as well. I read it and it's really, uh, I would re really recommend it. Um, but I wanted. It in Dutch? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was one of the lucky first. First one. Um, yeah, I wanted to start actually with um, um, where was this book coming from? Why did you find it so important to write it, and why um, uh, did you have to write it now, exactly at this moment? Actually, I would. I wrote the book in the end of uh, 2016. It was uh, the year of the Brexit. It was the year Donald Trump was elected. Mm -hmm. And um, it was also a year where the far-right party of France, of Marine Le Pen, um, was very high uh, in the polls, uh, one year before the French uh, presidential elections. Mm -hmm. And so um, my first question was, um, uh, are, we, are we about to, 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 to forget? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, I think it is a question that many people have, actually. Um, but um, I thought, well, uh, what can I do actually maybe to bring my part and to contribute um, to the work of memory? Because something has been maybe has failed. Mm -hmm. um, and the first step for me was to look uh, towards my family history. Um, because it is uh, probably the best way to get interested uh, in, in this history. Mm -hmm. And also because I wanted to share this history with the new generations uh, who are less and less interested in that past. And this is one problem everybody has also in Germany, where this memory work has worked for a long time, but now it shows also uh, its uh, uh, limits. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the best way to interest new generations to that past is uh, to uh, raise their attention about their family history to make them understand that it is also part of the family, mm -hmm. this history. To make it a personal story. And also it is a European history, because in Europe, uh, everybody in each family in Europe has is linked to this uh, history. Mm -hmm. And was it also hard for you to write this on the one side, a very personal book, and at the same time also a very political book? How did you deal with those two dimensions? Well, I think uh, when you start to write about the past, um, you have to think of uh, how can you write about something which never, which doesn't exist anymore. You have a kind of responsibility towards this past. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we know about the past? We have uh, different uh, traces. So there is the official history. Um, then there are the memories for those who have uh, lived this past, mm -hmm. or the memory which has been transmitted in the families. Um, and then there are gaps in between, mm -hmm. of course. Oh, and there is also the collective memory, <coughs> which is transmitted through uh, fiction, films, uh, novels, um, uh, memorial uh, celebrations. Mm -hmm. This is the collective memory. And so I tried to mix the three of them, the family uh, memory, the official history, and this uh, collective memory. Mm -hmm. um, first, because I think if you write about the past and you only write about your own family history, uh, I think it's a bit risky because the memory is filtrated uh, through hate, uh, through emotions, or through, with love for your family also, mm -hmm. you know? which can <coughs> filtrate a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is important always to compare because uh, the truth is something in between. And the problem with official history is that most of the people don't identify with official history. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just uh, doing a film right now about the, just the time after the wall fell uh, in East Germany and um, actually, after the wall fell in East Germany, there was a big trauma. And the official history is, official, is a quite positive yeah. official history, yeah. you know? So you can see people don't identify with this official positive history. Um, and so to reach more people, you, you need to cross all these lines and to, to make your way in this labyrinth. 
But it must also be really difficult to integrate all those different realities into one book, right? Well, <laughs> this is, I mean, this is, you have, when you write, you have to, you, you need a challenge. Uh, so this was a challenge. It was, mm -hmm. I wasn't sure if it would work out because it's, um, as you said, it's not easy to, to write, to mix both of them. Uh, for the narration, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it, it worked. Um, yes, because mm -hmm. also the, the history of my grandfather, my grandfather, uh, bought uh, a Jewish um, company in 1938 for a low price, so he took profit from um, the the situation of the Jews at that time. And uh, I think by following the history of my grandfather, you can much more understand how the German people, normal people, the little Mitläufer, mm -hmm. lived this time, and what uh, what was their challenges, what was what choices they had and and didn't have. Mm -hmm. And how is your book received in uh, in in those European countries? Because you're also quite critical on the ways in which many European countries are currently dealing with their past and with uh, the black pages of their histories. Um, uh, what were the reactions of, uh, to your book in, for example, Italy and France? Uh, I was quite surprised that it was very well received in France, actually. <laughs> Because it's a, it's a book which uh, praises the way the Germans did this work, uh, which is not always welcome because, of course, the, the one of the reasons why the Germans did this work so much is also because they were guilty of, of horrendous crimes. Um, but still, uh, the French were very interested uh, because they could, I think they could feel that there is a, a link between the way the Germans have dealt with this past and the quality of their democracy. And there is also a link in France between the fact that uh, this past hasn't been really dealt with in a, uh, in a proper way because, for, for example, the people of France were exonerated mm -hmm. in this memory work. So the French uh, dealt very much with the Vichy regime, the collaboration of the French with the Nazi Germans, during the occupation, um, but um, they never addressed the question of what was the attitude of the people. Mm -hmm. And it's not to accuse them, it's just a very uh, interesting question to raise. And this question wasn't raised enough. Mm -hmm. um, so that um, the people always appear in France, and today also you can see with the uh, Gelbe Westen, the yellow vests, mm -hmm. yeah. I think. The I don't know in, in <laughs> Dutch how it sounds, yeah. but um, that there is still a kind of protection of uh, the people, that we <laughs> expect that there is a kind of wiseness coming from the people. Mm -hmm. uh, the Germans experienced in '32 that uh, people elected, you know, Hitler's party was elected democratically. Mm -hmm. So there is a different approach of. Uh, of the people. So this mm -hmm. was a reaction in France. And um, I think in Germany, uh, the reason why it was well received is because as being half French, I can praise this work. Uh, the Germans cannot say we did a good work. You know, it wouldn't be welcome, mm -hmm. but I, I, can, I can do it because I'm half French. And in Italy, it just uh, came out one uh, week ago, mm. um, but um, uh, I think in Italy, the society is divided in two. Mm -hmm. You have uh, one part of Italy which supports uh, Salvini and um, which tends uh, to rehabilitate fascism. And there is another part of Italy <coughs> which is very uh, aware of what's happening mm -hmm. and uh, who is quite happy about these kind of books. Mm -hmm. And an interesting quote uh, from your keynote uh, that you gave just now was... Um, First, one has to define one's identity, uh, and this is inseparable from one's memory. And could you elaborate a bit more on that, and where should we start in finding our European identity? Um, well, I mean, we should first be proud uh, to be part of a continent which is so uh, rich, you know, so sexy, <laughs> so sensual. There are so many cultures, so much, so many different foods and uh, landscape and arts. 
Um, but I was referring more to uh, the uh, the time when the European Un Union was born. Mm -hmm. That means just after the war. So uh, it was created on the memory of wars uh, and of uh, dictatorships mm -hmm. and of Holocaust. So actually it is a negative memory because it is based on that. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a memory we should um, definitely keep because uh, uh, we need to be vigilant because this, this memory should help us to identify uh, manipulation in politics. But is it enough to create this new European construction on a negative memory and a negative uh, idea of history? Is that enough to create a sense of European identity? Um, I think that um, negative memory was um, also kind of invented by the Germans. Uh, just after the war, until the 60s, most of the European countries didn't do any memory work. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Germans started to do this work in the late 60s. Uh, and this negative um, uh, memory has, I think, uh, worked for until now um, to prevent us mm -hmm. of uh, uh, voting for extreme political parties. In Germany, political parties only entered in the Bundestag in 2017. So it worked until 2017 yeah. uh, to prevent. But um, since 2017, we can see that it's not enough, yeah. as you said. Um, and so the, the need we have is maybe to think more um, positive but which means not only thinking of our, our uh, uh, failures, but also the fact that we actually, after 45 and after 89, defeated um, fascism and communist totalitarianism, and that we were able to build democracy, mm -hmm. which is actually a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I focus also in my book on this time after the war, how the Germans built this democracy, because it wasn't at all obvious that it would happen. Uh, and if this democracy has been built, it's uh, thanks to some generations, also heroes we have in that history. And I think these heroes of after the war, we don't hear them any, any uh, enough. We don't see them enough in films, in fiction, in novels. How is um, it possible that we forgot th this positive story? Because we were too much focused on the war. And mm -hmm. uh, perhaps also, I know it is uh, it's a difficult to say and to hear, um, perhaps also too much focused on the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. So that um, this, this focus uh, today raises the question of, isn't it this, this focus on the Holocaust didn't it lead to more anti-Semitism in the end, mm -hmm. what we experience today. So we have to rethink a little bit. Mm -hmm. People need positive memory because people are not uh, only uh, fed with rational thinking. They need also um, dreams. And stories. They and need and stories. <laughs> they, na they need narr narrations, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and not only negative. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the populists are winning so much ground because they are very emotional. So they feed this need for emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and the European Union in Brussels didn't succeed in giving the dream of Europe mm -hmm. emotions. And who do you think would be responsible for creating this narrative or creating this sense of a European story, a European, an attractive European story. Hmm. Who well, should, for, from, from, should this come from Brussels or from the national politicians um, or from the people or from? Well, normally it's not something you can impose. No. Uh, or you, you do like Putin, you know? I mean, Vladimir Putin is very good at that. Um, he's rewriting the past the whole time. And so yeah. he only finds heroes in the past. Yeah. And unfortunately, it works because the Russians are very 
much patriots. Um, there is also a whole uh, film industry in Moscow, which is feeding this need for patriotism. And uh, it, it's very good we don't have that in Brussels. You know? <laughs> uh, so it should come from, you know, from the people. Uh, I, I, I don't have the clue now. I think uh, myself, I think I would love maybe to make a kind of Netflix uh, series about how the East, you know, the Eastern countries, uh, one after the other, mm -hmm. uh, the people raised against the dictatorships, 56 in Hungary, then 68 in Prague. So you have really magnificent stories there. You don't have to invent them, but they are nowhere to see. And it, should, it would also be very good to uh, give um, to the Eastern, pe Eastern European people to give them back this, this uh, pride, mm -hmm. you know? This is also a failure of Europe. This is something that is lacking at the moment, yes. you would say. Yes, when we think Europe, I don't think many people think Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know, but mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we're very much concentrating also on the French-German relationship, mm -hmm. uh, which I should be happy uh, about. But I think it might be now not uh, accurate anymore. No, uh, because Europe is, is they feel uh, excluded by this German-French uh, friendship. You know. But but what are according to you like the main differences in this um, uh, in the history, the way European history is described in the West and in the East. What are the main things that are overlooked in the current narrative? Sorry, I didn't get it. Um, what, are the, what are the main, uh, the most important differences you, you mentioned um, uh, that were, that our sense of history, of European history is biased towards the West mainly and that we forgot the stories of the East, but what, uh, what are the most important stories that we overlook or how should we make it more inclusive, this idea of European history? Um, well, um, I mean, as I said, I think uh, first maybe the medias, you know, the journalists, uh, I don't know about the, the Netherlands, but uh, in France, uh, nobody knows anything about uh, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think they even know the names of the, of the countries. Okay, there are many of them. It's not easy to place them on a map, uh, but um, uh, that's, mm. that's the first uh, problem. So you don't have anything in the, in the newspapers about this country. So how can you, uh, on this basis, how can you uh, feed a, a European identity? And the, the most important things we hear in the newspapers are about um, uh, the failure of the rule of law, the uh, nationalist rhetorics of Orban and Kaczynski. And yeah. So it's actually only a negative story maybe we hear. It's also, uh, there is a lot of arrogance towards these countries um, because in the end, we always uh, forget that they paid the, the biggest price for the war in the end, you know, because they were um, on the wrong side of uh, the Iron Curtain. Um, and so 40 years long, they lived uh, in a system which was a dictatorship, which was closed from, I mean, totally isolated. Mm -hmm. um, and um, where personal initiative was not encouraged. Mm -hmm. It was actually banned. Also thinking was banned. You, you could, there was only one political party. So there was no civil society. Uh, there mm -hmm. was no access to culture, uh, to, to, to non-Sovietic allowed culture. Uh, there were no strangers in these countries, so no foreigners. Um, so uh, they were very uh, homog homogenic, mm -hmm. you know, homogenic, mm -hmm. living in their bubble. Mm -hmm. And suddenly uh, the West tries to impose its uh, vision of a multicultural society. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't, you know, you don't, educate people, or maybe they just don't want multicultural societies, you mm -hmm. know, but we should not for forget the experience of the people, the biographies, and we're not interested in that. So um, I think the film, media's fiction is a very good mean mm -hmm. to reach uh, a, a lot of people and to m make them aware 
that we just don't have the same history. The uh, Western Europe was built on the memory of the war. Uh, 40 years long, we tried, not everybody uh, uh, as good as the other, but to make this memory work. Yeah. Uh, and in Germany, for example, in West Germany, democracy was built on the memory work, mm -hmm. but only in the West. You know, so wh when the uh, wall fell, suddenly they discovered that the other Germans hadn't done this work at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that 30 years are enough to uh, catch up. And would you also uh, say that um, uh, the fact that we see this rise of nationalists and populist uh, parties in Eastern Europe does has a relation with the fact that this memory work isn't done well? Is it something we could say? In the East? Yeah. Well, um, so what happened in the East is that it's, 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 uh, um, you have to separate East Germany and the rest of uh, Eastern Euro mm -hmm. European countries. But um, the Soviet Union imposed its memory. So the memory of the Soviet Union uh, is the big uh, victory of the Red Army. So all the Eastern European countries had to celebrate the Red Army. Even if five countries in the East were actually allied of the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. So you imagine the schizophrenia. So they were actually commemorating the enemy. Mm. This during 40 years. <laughs> and in the same, at the same time, they didn't have any space to reflect about their own role during the war as allies of the Third Reich mm -hmm. and, of course, as uh, contributors uh, of the Holocaust. Uh, so basically nothing has been done in this direction to reflect on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, the worst case is, of course, uh, East Germany, because East Germany was Germany, so it was the Third Reich, and so they manage in this uh, totally schizophrenic uh, turnover, to see them themselves as uh, victims, mm -hmm. communist victims, mm -hmm. or even heroes, uh, ad identifying with uh, the, the, the Red Army. Mm -hmm. How could we, if we're trying, of course, the subject of tonight is in search of a, Euro a, a European people and in search of a European identity. How could we ever find this notion of a European people? Is that something we should look for, or is that something we should... Should we look for European peoples instead? Yeah, well, I think there, there is a European people. A European people. I mean, the, the first sign of it mm -hmm. is when you leave Europe. <laughs> <laughs> because you miss it a lot. <laughs> uh, and when you're in the United States, you miss Europe because you can, you can feel, it's not always, you cannot define it. Because as I said, maybe the identity of Europe, <laughs> the identity of Europe is to have all these identities. That, that's why it's difficult to find one definition of the European So the people. identity of, of, of a European is the ability to have several identities and to yes. choose your own yes. identity as well. That's an, an exactly, and to have this uh, freedom to choose your identity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, and as, as soon as you leave Europe, <coughs> you can, whatever continent you are you're on, you can feel the difference. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, this is, also, this is a, a, a sufficient sign um, that Europe is my home. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you have the culture. You have, uh, uh, we are, have only been talking about the European Union. But before that, um, you, had Euro you, know, you had Europe uh, with all the empires. And the empires uh, gave, actually, the opportunity to all the cultures to mix mm -hmm. together. And this is uh, our heritage. Um, we are uh, very much mixed. And I think the best way today, because we don't have the empires anymore, and we have all these separate countries, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, the best way is culture. It's really it's, uh, culture. Um, and, and because culture is transnational, because mm -hmm. music is transnational. Mm -hmm. and, and this is uh, probably the best way today to uh, to to 
regain this uh, European identity. The problem is that um, it is not in the messages of the European Union are too rational. Mm -hmm. We need more uh, pathos. And because you just showed uh, uh, Germany and, and France, Macron mm -hmm. and Merkel, it's, it's very interesting because Merkel and Germany, they have a very rational approach mm -hmm. of the European Union. Very much also worried about the money, you know? Uh, and, and Macron is a uh, very uh, euphoric, very a uh, bit irrational uh, with all his path a pathos. Passionate European. Passionate. Uh, the Germans can't afford to be passionate because of their history. Mm -hmm. So actually, it's, I think it's a good combination, mm -hmm. the two approaches. What do you think uh, will happen to this uh, combination after Merkel leaves the political stage? Probably this fall or next, next year? But oh, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm first. I'm waiting for the European elections. <laughs> this is the first step, uh, and the rest yeah. is uh, just um, speculation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. I wanted to propose that we're going uh, to look at the video message that uh, Raphael Enthoven um, uh, made for this evening because he couldn't be there on here, unfortunately. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to briefly introduce Raphael. Raphael is a well-known public philosopher in France. In France, he is a, a professor of philosophy, a writer, and he uh, is uh, regularly appearing on Fran French TV, uh, on the radio, and he also wrote a really interesting book. I don't know if you uh, read it, uh, Geraldine. It's called Little Brother, and in uh, this collection of essays, he's reflecting on... Um, uh, on everyday life, and it's really, I, I read some part of, parts of it, it's really uh, funny and interesting and sharp at the same time. Um, but tonight he commented on the main subject uh, of this evening, and um, uh, it's in French, but you can find uh, English translation on your seat, so uh, even if you don't speak French, I hope you can uh, get, uh, get some insight into what he's trying to tell tonight. We will be back uh, within... Some moments. D'abord, chers amis inconnus, je vous prie de m'excuser. Si je ne suis pas parmi vous ce soir, c'est que j'en ai été empêché. Et c'est à regret que je remplace une rencontre par une vidéo. Remplacer n'est pas un bon mot, en vérité, parce que rien ne remplace l'échange qu'on aurait eu si j'avais pu venir. Donc, voici quelques remarques sur la question européenne que je voudrais partager avec vous et sur la vague brune qui tente de submerger le vieux continent. Ces remarques, je m'empresse de le dire, sont gouvernées par deux axiomes, un pessimisme anthropologique et un optimisme institutionnel. Alors, le pessimisme anthropologique me vient de Nietzsche. Euh, quand on lit euh, Nietzsche, c'est dans ses fragments qu'il écrit ça. Écoutez-le. « Ce que je vois se préparer lentement et comme avec hésitation, c'est l'Europe unie. » Ce que je vois se préparer lentement et comme avec hésitation, c'est l'Europe unie. Nietzsche écrit ça en 1885. Les fragments de Nietzsche, vous le savez, sont rassemblés indûment sous le titre de volonté de puissance. Et ils comportent des perles d'avenir dont la, la prédiction stupéfiante d'une Europe unie que, malgré le vacarme des exaltés, il se réjouit de voir se préparer lentement et comme avec hésitation. Ce qui est fou, c'est que Nietzsche est extrêmement critique à l'endroit de l'Europe, dont il diagnostique l'incurable évolution vers, citation, un christianisme opiacé, pire, un bouddhisme européen, qui part d'un monde en noir et blanc, c'est-à-dire en bien et mal, pour culminer dans un culte de l'hyperactivité. Écoutez-le. « Dès maintenant, en Europe, on a honte du repos. La longue méditation provoque des remords. On ne pense plus autrement que montre en main, comme on déjeune, le regard fixé sur les bulletins de la bourse. On vit comme quelqu'un qui, sans cesse, pourrait rater quelque chose. » Prise entre le marteau de la culture moderne et l'enclume des valeurs absolues, qu'elles soient scientifiques ou religieuses, l'Europe, aux yeux de Nietzsche, dépérit rapidement, mais sûrement. Sa culture, pense-t-il, est une culture de la pensée moribonde. L'indépendance d'esprit y est introuvable, aussi rare que l'air pur dans la ville. Et l'individu est interchangeable. L'individu européen n'est qu'un rouage plus ou moins huilé dans un grand processus laborieux. 
Les Européens, dans leur ensemble, sont des moutons stériles qui survalorisent l'objectivité parce qu'ils ont peur de souffrir et dont les forces se dissipent, dit-il, dans une décharge immédiate et dont de vagues aspirations communes recouvrent le sentiment qu'il vaut mieux faire n'importe quoi plutôt que rien. Reste la politique, dit Nietzsche. Alors on va se dire, voilà, il va se rassurer avec la politique. Pas du tout. Qu'est-ce que c'est que la politique C'est un terrain où sévit l'infection. La politique, dit-il, est occupée par des myopes aux décisions hâtives qui flattent les ferveurs nationalistes, qui sont les formes ordinaires d'un fanatisme où s'exprime la faiblesse de la volonté. Il faudrait, près dit Nietzsche, des demi-siècles entiers pour surmonter ces crises ataviques de régionalisme et d'attachement à la glèbe et revenir à la raison, je veux dire, au bon européanisme. Et c'est ça qui est étonnant, c'est que tout espoir pour Nietzsche n'est pas perdu, au contraire. D'abord, l'unité de l'Europe à ses yeux est une nécessité économique. Écoutez-le encore. Les petits États d'Europe vont devenir intenables économiquement. Il est en 1885 quand il écrit ça. Intenables économiquement vu les exigences souveraines des grandes relations internationales et du grand commerce qui réclame l'extension suprême des échanges universels, un commerce mondial. Et il termine en disant « L'argent à lui seul obligera l'Europe, tôt ou tard, à se coaguler en une seule masse. » Ceux qui ont voulu construire l'Europe par des réalisations concrètes n'ont pas pensé autrement. Ce qu'on appelle ce processus d'humanisation, ou progrès, c'est-à-dire en fait le fait que les moutons européens s'affranchissent progressivement d'un milieu déterminé, finira, aux yeux de Nietzsche, par donner naissance à un type d'humanité, dit-il, essentiellement supranational, vaguement retardé par l'urticaire patriotique qui accompagne et qui tempère cette tendance irrépressible. Mieux, du terreau démocratique que compose le triomphe des médiocres et, dit-il, des ouvriers bons à tout, bavards, faibles de volonté et utilisables à toute fin, surgit par intermittence, comme une fleur du mal, un type d'homme fort, de tyrans qui, par la prodigieuse diversité de leur expérience et de leur talent, sauront unir ce costume d'arlequin. Autrement dit, ça n'est pas l'union qui fait la force, c'est la force qui fait l'union. Seulement la force n'est pas le pouvoir, mais le génie. Et la puissance n'est pas la violence, mais la maîtrise. Les tyrans dont parle Nietzsche ne sont pas tel ou tel peintre raté qui par haine de soi conduira l'Allemagne à sa ruine. Non, les tyrans, ce sont les esprits vastes et profonds de ce 19e siècle stupide. Goethe, Beethoven, Stendhal, Heinrich Heine, Schopenhauer et même Wagner. Voyez, le diagnostic de Nietzsche est troublant parce que sa prédiction est juste. L'Europe unie. Mais le chemin qui le conduit à cette prédiction n'est pas du tout flatteur pour ceux qui le concernent. C'est parce qu'on est des moutons que l'Europe va s'unir. S'il y a un peuple européen émergent, c'est un peuple de moutons que l'indifférenciation séduit davantage que la reconnaissance des génies singuliers et des particularités. L'avantage de son diagnostic, et ce qu'il a de rassurant, c'est qu'il inscrit la construction européenne dans une nécessité. Si c'est par le haut, par la morale, par les valeurs que l'Europe doit se construire, si la construction européenne repose uniquement sur la mobilisation des volontés et l'édification rationnelle d'un espace de tolérance et de paix, eh bien, ça ne marchera pas. L'Europe n'existera que si elle fonctionne. Et elle ne fonctionnera que si les gens n'ont pas le sentiment qu'elle se fait sans eux. Et la possibilité même d'une mémoire collective, la construction si importante d'une mémoire collective, l'enseignement, la transmission d'une mémoire collective, avec examen des liens qui unissent les différentes nations du vieux continent, tout cela ne sera possible que si l'Europe est d'abord le fer de lance d'une logique économiquement vertueuse qui, sans abolir l'inégalité, s'arrange pour que les inégalités profitent à ceux qui ont moins que les autres et où, sans abolir la souveraineté, la totalité des décisions se prenne à la majorité qualifiée. Et où, enfin, sans entraver la possibilité d'un gouvernement, les individus se sentent représentés par leurs élus et les élus se sentent comptables des suffrages qui se sont portés sur eux. J'en viens maintenant, plus spécifiquement, à la question de l'extrême droite. Le diagnostic de la radicalisation, de l'extrême droitisation de l'Europe est aisé à faire. On est face à une vague brune. Il suffit de compter les points à chaque élection et d'observer que tous les cinq ans, la boue a monté dans les urnes. 
l'Europe brunit. En valeur absolue, depuis 15 ans, l'extrême droite a considérablement progressé en Europe. On peut citer l'arrivée de trois ministres du Parti libéral autrichien, libéral mal nommé, à des postes régaliens. Euh, c'était en décembre 2017. Mais c'était le dernier épisode euh, en 2017 d'une poussée qui remonte à, à la fin du XXe siècle. Déjà en 1999, l'extrême droite faisait partie du gouvernement autrichien. Pareil en Slovaquie entre 2006 et 2010, de nouveau depuis 2016. En Bulgarie, les Patriotes Unis ont 27 députés alliés au Premier ministre. Au Danemark, l'extrême droite a soutenu le, le, le gouvernement sans en faire partie. En Norvège, le Parti du Progrès, tu parles compte aujourd'hui, enfin, on va compter sept ministres. Aux Pays-Bas, Gerd Wilders a tutoyé les sommets. On pourrait aussi citer UKIP au Royaume-Uni, la Ligue du Nord en Italie, les 16 députés nazis grecs sous l'étiquette Aube Dorée, le Brexit, c'est-à-dire la victoire des menteurs qui l'ont admis ensuite, des démagogues, des irresponsables qui refusent d'assumer le pouvoir que, de fait, ils ont conquis à cette occasion. Bref, on ne manque pas d'exemples. Une telle progression de l'extrême droite, de la droite et de l'extrême droite et du complotisme menace-t-elle la construction européenne Ou a-t-elle pour effet, paradoxalement, de la renforcer On peut, d'un point de vue, du point de vue des valeurs, d'un point de vue moral, tenir le retour de la peste avec un grand P comme un danger. C'est l'évidence. Et se donner bonne conscience en le dénonçant. Mais on peut aussi constater que l'idée européenne, paradoxalement, a tout à gagner à ce que ses concitoyens vérifient la nullité de l'extrême droite quand elle arrive aux affaires. Un peu comme la démocratie américaine, dont les institutions sont plébiscitées depuis qu'un populiste est à sa tête et dont les journaux gagnent des lecteurs depuis qu'un menteur gouverne le pays. Regardez ce qui s'est passé en Finlande. Les vrais Finlandais, comme ils s'appellent ou comme ils s'appelaient, ont été divisés, laminés par leur expérience gouvernementale. Regardez l'État, non pas électoral, mais l'État structurel du Front National depuis qu'il a passé le premier tour de la présidentielle et que les Français ont constaté l'indigence et la nullité de sa dirigeante dans les débats cruciaux. C'est le propre des partis d'extrême droite, que voulez-vous Ils sont tellement mauvais qu'ils sont toujours durablement vaincus par leur propre victoire. Il suffit que ces pitres-là arrivent aux affaires ou qu'ils montrent le bout de leur nez verruqueux pour que l'Europe, la démocratie, les droits de l'homme et la tolérance marque des points. Dernier exemple en date, évidemment, euh, l'Italie. Dans le contexte du ralentissement de la croissance en Europe, l'Italie apparaît aujourd'hui comme la plus fragile. Certains craignent même qu'elle puisse entraîner l'Union européenne dans sa chute. Alors, peut-on aller jusqu'à dire que plus l'extrême droite progresse, mieux l'Europe se porte Bon, ce serait optimiste. Disons plutôt que plus l'extrême droite se plante, mieux l'Europe se porte. Et pour se planter, il faut pour un temps avoir les leviers en main. Le philosophe Hegel appelle ça, vous le savez, la ruse de la raison. L'idée en est simple. Le progrès de la raison impose, paradoxalement, dialectiquement, de mobiliser l'irrationnel. C'est en laissant faire les hommes, en laissant fermenter leurs passions, leurs égoïsmes ou leurs sottises, que l'on gagne, in fine, en rationalité. Les acteurs de l'histoire ne sont aux yeux du penseur que les pantins d'une rationalité qui marche en zigzag, à leur insu, via leur délire, vers un monde meilleur. Alors, sans être hegelien, on peut admettre que la meilleure façon d'être séduit par l'Europe et donc dégoûté par l'extrême droite est encore, je crois, de la voir à l'œuvre. Et qu'à ce titre, pour détruire l'extrême droite, nous n'avons besoin que de l'extrême droite. Je voudrais vous proposer un autre exemple du retournement dialectique auquel l'extrême droite s'expose. Quand Victor Orban l'a emporté en Hongrie, Marine Le Pen a déclaré « Grande et nette victoire de Victor Orban en Hongrie, l'inversion des valeurs et l'immigration de masse prônées par l'Union européenne sont à nouveau rejetées, les nationaux peuvent être majoritaires en Europe aux prochaines élections européennes de 2019. » Point d'exclamation, fermez la citation. Or, la réaction de Marine Le Pen à la victoire en Hongrie du gouvernement de, de Victor Orban est aussi compréhensible que contradictoire. Idéologiquement, il n'y a pas de problème, hein, c'est l'évidence. Orban et Marine Le Pen, c'est un peu blanc bonnet et bonnet blanc. C'est-à-dire, euh, tout comme le serait celle du Rassemblement national, la politique économique du Premier ministre hongrois est résolument euh, nationaliste, dépensière, euh, insoucieuse de la dette. Son discours est constamment médiaphobe, bruxellophobe, russophile. Je veux dire, Orban prospère et entame son, son énième mandat sur les deux diables opportuns de l'immigration de masse et de l'islam. 
et l'administration hongroise est largement sous contrôle, à l'image de Marine Le Pen menaçant de mettre au pas les fonctionnaires non patriotes si elle est élue. De ce point de vue, il est tout à fait logique que la dirigeante frontiste ou rassembleuse, dont le discours est identique, se, fécili, se félicite pardon, de, de la victoire du populiste hongrois. En fait, la contradiction saute aux yeux quand on songe à un album de Johann Sfar, le septième album du chat du rabbin, qui s'appelle « La tour de Babelwed. Dans cet album génial, on fait la connaissance de deux personnages très cons, très antipathiques, mais encore plus émouvants, qui sont le rabbin du rabbin et l'imam de l'imam. Et les deux ont en commun de ne rien vouloir mettre en commun. Et ils passent leur temps à déplorer fraternellement les méfaits de la fraternité, à tel point qu'ils en viennent un jour à constituer le comité des juifs et des musulmans qui refusent de prier ensemble. Et le comité est très actif. Les intégristes sont nombreux, se réunissent souvent, et entre eux, des liens se tissent, des amitiés se nouent. En un mot, la fraternité fait son œuvre. Tout comme le désir de vivre à distance les uns des autres rapproche Marine Le Pen et Victor Orban. Ce que je veux dire, c'est quelle différence entre des europhobes de plusieurs pays qui fraternisent et des intolérants de plusieurs confessions qui se réunissent Quelle différence entre des nationalistes qui saluent l'internationalisation de leurs idées et des intolérants juifs et musulmans qui communient dans le refus de s'entendre. C'est la même contradiction. Leur discours est infidèle à leur démarche. Leur matière est infidèle à leur manière. Ils fusionnent entre gens dont le programme est d'être disjoints. Ils se réunissent pour dénoncer ceux qui voudraient qu'ils vivent ensemble. Et ce faisant, à leur corps défendant, les intégristes qui se soutiennent contribuent au développement de la laïcité, un peu comme les europhobes qui s'européanisent contribuent au développement de l'Europe. L'Europe est aussi l'horizon commun des gens qui communient paradoxalement et sans s'en apercevoir dans le désir d'être séparés. De ce point de vue, je crois qu'il faut saluer le Brexit. Le Brexit, c'est un miracle une saignée salutaire, une amputation qui nous dissuade de recommencer pour les cent ans qui viennent. Pourvu que le Brexit provoque une tempête financière et que la Grande-Bretagne soit en situation de devoir renégocier l'ensemble de ses accords commerciaux avec l'ensemble de ses partenaires, pourvu qu'il n'y ait pas d'accord, pourvu que Theresa May cède la place à quelqu'un qui s'en sorte encore moins bien qu'elle, pourvu que le pays s'appauvrisse et que les barrières douanières explosent, pourvu que les investisseurs s'en aillent, pourvu que la croissance chute, pourvu que même les joueurs de foot se cassent pourvu que l'Écosse et l'Irlande du Nord restent en Europe, pourvu que la Grande-Bretagne se disloque, et s'il faut ça pour comprendre ce qu'ils ont fait, pourvu que les choses se passent mal, il faut que le Royaume-Uni, puisqu'il a historiquement endossé le rôle de testeur, de goûteur de poison, boive le calice jusqu'à la lit, et que nous ayons, grâce au Brexit, l'occasion de détailler les catastrophes qui attendent le pays qui s'aventure hors de l'Europe, d'où chacun peut sortir quand il le souhaite. Le Brexit, c'est l'occasion sinon d'une prise de conscience, en tout cas d'un effroi. Et la peur est bonne conseillère en matière européenne, quand elle a l'intelligence de chercher refuge à plusieurs. C'est l'heuristique de la peur, l'expression que Hans Jonas, dans le principe responsabilité, emploie à propos du climat, convient parfaitement à la question européenne et au danger qu'elle court. La meilleure façon d'avoir peur, et de voir ce qui arrive à celui qui joue avec sa propre liberté et qui lutte pour la servitude comme s'il s'agissait de la liberté. En vérité, vous voyez ce qui se passe, c'est que l'extrême droite, à mon avis, est prise, malgré elle, dans la nasse européenne, comme elle est prise dans la nasse du système qu'elle dénonce. Non pas en vertu d'une logique économique qui écraserait les velléités souverainistes, mais en vertu d'une logique démocratique qui veut qu'à force d'européaniser le combat anti-européen, on renforce, quand on est europhobe, l'adversaire qu'on se donne. D'ailleurs, évidemment, Marine Le Pen, enfin, elle ne sait pas trop ce qu'elle veut, mais ne veut pas sortir de l'Europe. Ni l'extrême droite, ni l'extrême gauche ne veulent sortir de l'Europe. Les seuls en France à vouloir en sortir, c'est deux partis croupions, l'UPR et les Patriotes. Alors, les gens veulent bien combattre l'Europe. Ils veulent bien percevoir les dividendes politiques du combat contre l'idée européenne et ce monstre froid, mais de là à en sortir, il y a un pas que personne, ou presque, n'ose franchir, n'ose revendiquer. Voyez, 
Le brunissement ou le pourrissement de l'Europe me semble donc à tempérer pour ces deux raisons. La première, c'est que plus l'extrême droite gouverne, moins elle risque, je crois, de gouverner longtemps. La seconde, c'est que plus l'extrême droite s'unit à travers tout le continent, plus elle contribue au mouvement contre lequel elle prétend lutter de toutes ses forces. Encore une fois, sa manière est infidèle à sa matière. Cet optimisme pessimiste, bien sûr, ne doit pas nous décourager de lutter pour la construction d'une mémoire commune, d'un peuple commun soudé par le désir de n'être plus en guerre. Mais ça doit nous rassurer, je crois, au contraire, sur le fait que cette entreprise, l'Europe, cette utopie concrète, merveilleuse qu'on appelle l'Europe unie, n'est pas seulement le résultat d'une morale abstraite, mais c'est une construction patiente que le cynisme commande autant que la vertu et qui est étayée tous les jours par une nécessité qui, par-delà bien et mal, rapproche irrésistiblement les peuples, à commencer par ceux qui voudraient qu'on les sépare. Je suis désolé d'être séparé de vous aujourd'hui. Je suis heureux de pouvoir vous parler, navré de ne pas pouvoir vous entendre. Je vous salue et je vous dis à bientôt. So that was Rafael Enthoven. Geraldine, what is your first reaction? Or it's, it's hard, maybe it's good to first try to summarize what he tried to say in this message. So on the one hand, he's quite pessimistic about the people and uh, at the same time, quite optimistic about the role of institutions, I would say. Um, and what I found also really interesting is that he um, said that the populists can even maybe in the end bring Europe closer together. Um, so yeah, what, what, what did you think about it? What, is, what did you disagree with? Maybe that's interesting to start well, it's with. It's very nice to hear someone optimistic. <laughs> I would say he's quite an optimistic with, with pessimist or a pessimistic optimist in a way. I don't know how to describe it, but... Maybe well, it is, it is of, of course, a scenario which uh, is uh, possible, but uh, um, I, I doubt it uh, for different reasons. Um, um, the first thing, I mean, he mentioned many, many things. <laughs> uh, what you mentioned about the institutions, he compares, I don't, I don't know if you followed everything, but he compares at some point the institutions in the United States with the institutions in Europe, saying that uh, actually Trump uh, brought the institutions in the United States closer and uh, revealed mm -hmm. how strong they are, mm -hmm. which is true, but it's the United States. And for example, in uh, Europe, for example, in France, I can't say about the Netherlands. I don't know the Netherlands uh, uh, well enough. Uh, I doubt that the institutions are strong enough mm -hmm. uh, if uh, a populist party comes to power. We don't have the same institutions. Mm -hmm. We don't have the same medias. We don't mm -hmm. have uh, the same uh, 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 separation of powers with um, uh, and also, we are not, uh, we are a centralized uh, state. Mm -hmm. um, the, the United States is a federal state. So each region has much more power than in France. Mm -hmm. Like California also has shown how powerful it can mm -hmm. be against Trump. It is not the case of France, and it is not a case of most of the countries of uh, the European Union. So I wouldn't make that bet. Mm -hmm. Also, um, I remember, I remember uh, having read about the Brexit, that the Brexit is uh, also the result of too much confidence uh, in the institutions. And in the European institutions or the, the no, national in the institutions? British, in the British institutions, mm -hmm. in the British system, too much confidence so that people think, oh, we, we will deal with it. We will manage. Mm -hmm. So it's also a big problem to have too much trust in these institutions. Mm -hmm. um, then he says something about uh, uh, quoting Nietzsche uh, that if the union functions economically, 
then everything will function more mm -hmm. or less. Yeah. You know, I'm just yeah. summarizing. Yeah. But uh, actually, the union functions. And uh, there is a big distrust mm -hmm. towards Europe. So we are actually experience exactly the contrary. But do you really think that the union is functioning? Well, in on the way? economic level, uh, I think it does function quite well. Uh, I think the euro, nobody wants to get out of the euro. I think many countries, uh, like Poland, for example, has, um, has had a lot of support of the European mm -hmm. Union. And it's one of the most europhobic country. So I don't see the link. Because mm -hmm. this link is a rational link. Mm -hmm. But our problem today is irrationality. Mm -hmm. um, and this is um, the other question uh, he raises, uh, which is, uh, I think, the most uh, important part of the speech, mm -hmm. is um, the fact that the extreme right, he all know, all only speaks about the extreme right, mm -hmm. And um, I think we should also talk about, we should talk about populism because it's much more complex. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, extreme right, extreme left is uh, sometimes mixed. And so this is why people are totally confused. Mm -hmm. And the best example is uh, are the uh, yellow vests mm -hmm. in France. We don't know what it is. We don't know if it's extreme right, if it's extreme left. It's very confused. Uh, national socialism also had socialism in, in it. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was also partly socialist. And this is why uh, the, in the GDR, uh, people, the, the, the regime didn't talk about national socialism, but about s fascism. Yeah. Because they had a problem with the part of socialism in national socialism. Mm -hmm. So this is... Um, so I will, s I will speak about, about populism or extreme parties. Mm -hmm. uh, so he says that extreme parties uh, uh, could actually put Europe closer because if they come to power, they will show yeah. that, they have, um, that they are totally incapable and so it will put an end to them. They will defeat themselves but, in the uh, end. But I just want to remember that in 12 years, Hitler did a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. So, of course, after 12 <laughs> years, we noticed, yeah. okay, it wasn't a good idea, <laughs> but the damage which has been caused in that time, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I wouldn't uh, play with mm -hmm. fire. This is playing with mm -hmm. fire. Uh, for me. Yeah, and Antofin is quite optimistic about the role of institutions then, but what if those, um, uh, what if the um, uh, people in the parliament are uh, uh, taking their power back and uh, are defeating the European construction itself, for example? Um, um, yeah, this is one point, the institution, but I mean, if uh, the extreme right uh, uh, really uh, comes to power and has the majority uh, in, in a parliament, then it has, uh, you know, it has the power. So yeah. the institution, they just change the institution. Exactly. That's uh, yeah. how it works yeah. uh, in a democracy. Uh, I think this is um, the point he was, uh, what, what he was raising was um, they will be so, I mean, they will show how much incapable they are, so they will not be re-elected. But the thing is that they will have time to uh, uh, to, yeah. to destroy the institution, so there won't be any re-elections anyway. Uh, that's how I understood yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And um, and also I think, and this is important um, to raise that um, today, the tools these uh, parties have, or these movements, are much more efficient than the tools one century ago because we have um, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and we have social medias. Um, and so actually it's tools that the Stasi uh, would have dreamt of <laughs> uh, in, the, in the GDR. Um, so so I, I, I would invite to be uh, a bit uh, uh, more careful and, and vigil mm -hmm. vigilant than uh, mm -hmm. and not being too too optimistic and thinking that the institutions uh, will mm -hmm. will save us and focus more on the the role of people the role of people in the countries uh, yes because I think that the what is at stake uh, is not actually Europe or not Europe because he said um, well um, 
it's it's good also to raise the question would I, what do I want to be part of it or not mm -hmm. sure I mean everybody's free not to be part uh, uh, of Europe but uh, as I mentioned in my, in my speech um, even the populist parties and he said it even the populist parties want Europe yeah. yes I mean they organize a congress of the defenders of Europe they are working on a transnational but level it's, to it's just another Europe mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, uh, they are not different they ha they want to promote one identity mm -hmm. uh, which is then transnational um, but it's the same person it's the same profile mm -hmm. even if one is Dutch and the other French and the other Italian uh, it's nationalism which uh, uh, combine which which uh, make them um, solider <laughs> yeah exactly it's an anti-European measure then well it is another Europe yeah. which already has existed yeah this Europe has existed yeah exactly so the question is which Europe do you want yeah and uh, we shouldn't also underestimate, uh, and I think this is very difficult for us to judge, to estimate, is the consequences on our everyday life. Mm -hmm. It's impossible for us to imagine because we've never lived in a dictatorship. We've never lived the war. So this is also one reason why I, read, I, I wrote that book, because uh, we cannot imagine anymore mm -hmm. that it could happen. Um, so I think we are being a bit naive mm -hmm. because it seems impossible. Yeah, we uh, we don't know what it b would be like, and therefore we are ten we tend to take Europe for granted, right? Many of the young people. I think we play with fire a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, that's why um, I mentioned this uh, visit uh, in Austria because uh, because it was a congress uh, where the press was not invited. Um, they were much more free than they would be in front of television or in a debate, TV debate, or mm -hmm. you know, wherever in, in a condition where they are observed by journalists. Uh, and, and I was very shocked, I have to say, because these were not crazy fascists. There were two parties among them, which is one is at the government in Austria and the other is in the Bundestag in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, Exactly. And, and there is a real manipulation strategy how to replace our identity mm -hmm. by rewriting our mm -hmm. memory. And th this is the, the strategy. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know very much about um, Dutch politics, but um, I read um, one line of uh, Thierry Baudet. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, he said, um, I think just after he won the last elections or, or just before, he said uh, that he's, we're standing in front of runes, the runes of, uh, of our civilization, of, of what, has, uh, what was in the past uh, one of the biggest civilizations of the world. So the runes, uh, it took me a bit of time to understand that the runes he's describing uh, are the Netherlands. <laughs> so... Uh, one of the richest and most egalitarian country mm. in the world. Yeah. Uh, so you imagine the audience hearing that, uh, thinking, oh, uh, is, this, is this country in ruins? You know, so it is uh, spreading you know, lies, uh, confusion, mm -hmm. playing with, with emotions, uh, with fake memories. Mm -hmm. It's a very dangerous game. It's rewriting history, in a way. Re and, and our identity. And yeah, exactly. So yeah. imagine exactly. when you have tools like artificial yeah. intelligence in yeah. the hands of these people, what they can do with you. Mm -hmm. So we have to just have the, the right pictures. And, and we're, we're going to the audience uh, uh, in a bit, but, but I see questions already. Um, but um, uh, before we have uh, a few weeks coming up before the elections, and there is a lot at stake, is there something you could recommend uh, to do in the coming few weeks in order to make the best out of it? Um, well, I think... I know uh, it's a difficult question. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> Save the world. <laughs> you have two hours. Uh, well, no, I, th I thought of it uh, the last day. I thought that um, maybe talking in the families 
about the past. I know it sounds very old school and a bit uh, not very sexy, but because I really think that one of the problem of this election are the young people are not willing to go. I heard in France like 77% already announced, I mean in the polls, that they are just, they don't just don't want to go and vote. 77%. They won't, won't, just won't go, yeah, uh, last polls, 77%. I don't know, young people, what this means, but, um, well, maybe 18 until 25 or something like that. Yeah. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I think in the families, because um, I don't think uh, this can happen at school, uh, so that in the families, we talk more about mm -hmm. family history to understand where we come from, mm -hmm. to transmit this identity inside the families. I think it's, uh, it's very important. Thank you so much. I'm going to the audience to see if there is any questions. So please uh, raise your hand if you uh, want to ask a question to Geraldine. Mm -hmm. And I see the first person over here. Oui, um Thanks very much. I love your Netflix idea, by the way. Yes. Good, good idea. Um, you were just saying that Enthoven mainly focuses on, on, on the real, the extreme right wing. So, and you were talking more about the general populist movements. Could you break that down a bit more? Um, bringing conservatism, a word I haven't heard tonight, or even libertarianism, which is very upcoming as I see it. Thanks. Well, um, actually, I was more thinking of France, where you have also a um, big, um, uh, quite power influential uh, extreme um, left party of Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And um, I think that this party also fed the idea of populism. Populism is not only to vote for this party, but it's more, I have the feeling that it's contaminating the, the heads. It's also contaminating the medias. It's a way uh, of um, describing, uh, describing things, of reducing uh, reality, of um, uh, having um, a very reduced view of, of things which are very complex, you know? And through that, through social medias, through, uh, uh, how do you say, television uh, continue, um, live, how do you Live television, streaming? No, like, like news, news, news channels. Can, yeah, yeah. News channels, that there is the um, uh, reflection about the complexity of the world is being so much reduced, and this is for me uh, the beginning of a populist uh, thought, you know, like reducing complexity. So it's much mm -hmm. more than only some extreme right uh, parties. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? I see someone here in the back. Hello, thanks for your speak. Um, I would like to know um, if you share the same uh, idea. So I think that there is a rise of extreme right and extreme left, especially in France, because um, the European Union kind of stole our democracy. Uh, what I mean by that is that um, the people, they voted Francois Hollande, so the left party a few years ago, and they didn't saw any difference. And um, in the European treaties, there is quite a lot of things that are fixed. Um, I will not uh, mention all of them here. And um, if you want to modify them, you, you need to have the unanimity of all the countries. So I kind of feel that the people are a bit confused, that they vote maybe for a bit left, but they don't see it coming. And therefore, they are going more extreme. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure that uh, many French uh, know the European treaties, <laughs> and so that they that they know if uh, they're being respected or not. Uh, 
the, I think there is actually a gap between the achievements of the European Union and the perception of it, or the achievements of Europe, um, which, you know, I mean, we have peace, we have freedom, uh, so there are some achievements which are there, and there is a gap between the perception and the reality. Um, so my question is more, why is there this gap? How did it actually happen? And who is feeding it? And who is profiting of it? Um, and um, just to, to go back to Raphael uh, Antoven, because he said, well, if uh, extreme parties come to power, then we will see that they're incapable, and maybe they will also dismantle the European Union, and we will see. Uh, but I think that if the European Union is dismantled, uh, we will um, uh, lose a lot of uh, our sovereignty because uh, the uh, uh, influence of Russia on a political level, which will be much um, uh, damaging the sovereignty of, of the countries, especially in Eastern Europe, and the economic influence of China will also be a factor. So uh, we should also consider the European Union in a much more global context. I'm not sure I answered your question though. <laughs> uh, maybe I have a follow-up question to this because do you also think that the EU is just lacking a communicating what they do for the European people in a very concrete way? Because I think that many people would agree with you that, that, that the EU brought peace and prosperity uh, for, 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 for many European countries, but do you think they're oh, yeah, lacking yeah. also conveying this more pragmatic, uh, positive uh, uh, outcomes? Of yes, yes, of course, of course, but I think uh, it's actually the role of the national medias, and I can on only speak for France, uh, the medias in France, I mean, they only talk about Europe, uh, well, they, they started to talk about Europe two weeks ago, maybe one week ago, uh, just before uh, the uh, European elections. Uh, but, uh, I mean, probably, I don't know if you can confirm it, but it is also one of the problems that it's not being uh, communicated. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that the um, uh, representation of the Commission, EU Commission in Paris, mm -hmm. complains regularly because the media never invite them, mm -hmm. you know? So they are never invited in the medias. So how do you, you want them to communicate about what's happening in Brussels? It's interesting that you see a large role for especially the, the national media uh, reporting on European issues. Well, I mean, uh, what, what, what other medias do the people watch? They, sh they watch national media, so uh, there, is no inter there is no real European media. No, maybe so that's a problem as well. EU, the, <laughs> yeah, the EU depends. The EU depends on the media of each country. So if if uh, if they don't communicate about what's going on, then uh, nobody will know. Exactly. I'm just looking at the audience to see if there's one last question, and then we really have to uh, round up this conversation. Okay, I see qu two questions. I take two questions. Thank you very much, Jorgin. First of all, I, I really like your analysis, very sharp. But I have one comment, one about Raphael and one what we can still do. One about what Raphael said, what struck me, is how he, he kind of blamed the Brits and he kind of forgot that almost half of the British people wanted to stay and that the outcome of all of what he was sort of yeah. saying would really um, pay very much harm to the Brits but ultimately also very much to Europe. I think we would be very much suffering from it, one. And about what can still be done from our side, I totally agreed about the role of speaking actually to your family, friends, uh, neighbors, and so forth. But especially, I think still, the younger generation, they indeed take it for granted, but even today it happened again in the street, someone saying, oh, I found out we have Dutch European elections and I, I can actually vote. And I said, yeah, of course you can. And then we started the conversation. And then she was very pro-European by her problem, for example, was she said, I don't know for whom I should yeah. vote. I don't believe in any of them. So I want to vote, but who for? Hmm. Thank you so much. Do you want to respond to that? Or is it it's just a comment that we... <laughs> no, I 
I, I don't know no. either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. But it's an important point to make, I think. Uh, then the last question. Don't we forget an important phenomenon. That is the, the structural conflict of interest between further integration of Europe and national politicians. More integrations means less power for, lo for national politicians. That's why if you really are campaigning for your own power, for your own room, then you need to criticize further integration, actually. And that is the basic, in my opinion, of the... the, 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 of, the, the yeah. of the problem that is at stake tonight, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> what do you think, Geraldine? Um, I don't know if I've understood well, but um, I think that, uh, on the contrary, um, nationalists who are actually uh, making campaign for leaving the EU are putting their own country in danger and the sovereignty of their country because if the EU, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, breaks upon or dismantles, you will for certain have uh, the influence of Putin's Russia, you know, uh, which is already influencing the elections right now. So if there is no EU, it is totally naive the nationalists are actually quite naive to think that they will uh, keep their sovereignty. They will not. So this is the, the, this is the argument uh, to, to confront the nationalists, that they're actually not protecting the national interest, but on the contrary. Thank you very much, Geraldine, for being here tonight with us. Thank you very much uh, for being here tonight with us. I think we, you shared some insight into the complexity and the richness of European identity and what it means to be uh, European uh, uh, today. And also what the importance is of looking back at history in order to make Europe's future uh, more successful. So I wanted to thank you uh, for that and I wanted to invite you to join our other programs on uh, European issues in the coming weeks as well. Um, we have uh, an interesting program next week with the French thinker Dominique Moisy uh, on uh, fear and hope in Europe and he will especially focus on the role of young people and what they can do for Europe and how they sh should shape the European future. So I think that's going to be interesting as well. And if you want to know who you can vote for during the elections on the 23rd of May, um, you can come to uh, our program, the next generation of Europe uh, 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 MEPs, um, because we're having some, uh, uh, some female um, political candidates that are running for the elections. So thank you very much for being here tonight and have a nice evening. Thank you.